Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mark, <laughs> always special. Uh, so as my colleague said, my name is Luděk Schmid. I work in program management team. I do REL for more, more years than I can count. And I'm not sure that's good or bad. Uh, let's pretend it's good. Uh, before I start, I would like to know how many Red Hatters are in the room. Can you raise your hand? Ooh. OK, guys, so uh, I'll, I'll go through how we develop RHEL with focus on how we focus on upstream. So uh, if you know this a lot and you don't agree with me, uh, there's going to be like at least 10 minutes of questions after this one. Feel free to shoot at me. Um, uh, you know, I survived worse discussions. Uh, but let's, let's dive into it straight away, right? So what I look at, uh, I'll start with what's REL, with some really you know, basic definitions. Uh, then I look on what's, how we actually work with upstream. Uh, so that's actually basically how we touch what's outside of the company, how we work with, with the with companies, et cetera. Uh, then I look at how all of this actually impacts what we do. And then I'll try to wrap up. So uh, let's get started. So uh, you know, I was thinking where to start defining RHEL. And like RHEL's open source distribution, right? So I started to uh, you know what's actually an open source software. And you know, when I was doing the research, you know, Wikipedia is a great source of uh, definitions. So I used this one. And uh, for me, it was a great refresher how actually the open source is defined. And uh, don't forget that open source software is just a special case of open source. There's a, another term in Wikipedia there. And it's basically you know, a way uh, or type of computer software that allows sharing between users. Uh, the other piece I was looking at is how you can actually make money on something that's uh, that's for free, right? Everybody can download it, compile it, run it, deploy it, etc. And when I was looking through articles, I found four major ways that uh, can be actually used to run company that produces open source software. Uh, so the first one is support and services. That's where Red Hat is, right? We provide subscriptions. Uh, no, we provide consulting services, we provide support, and this is the value added that actually customers buy from us. They don't buy the software, they buy all the stuff around it. And they pay for it on annual basis, you know, we have different type of, types of contract. So this is what Red Hatters know, it's a refresher for the others. So that's the business we are in. There's actually two, uh, three more ways uh, that seems to be sustainable from a uh, long-term point of view. So the, the next one is advertisement partnerships. Um, what you can imagine behind that is uh, Mozilla Foundation, Mozilla Corporation, because of what they basically do is they get in contracts with companies to position searching services high in their list or you know, setting something as a de default service, like you know, Yahoo paid Mozilla years ago almost uh, 400 uh, million dollars to make Yahoo as a default search engine. So that's actually another sustainable way how you can run business in open source. Uh, the third one is paid additional features. What I mean by that is you, you know, and that, that's a lot of company do, uh, you basically uh, provide core of the software as an open source and then features that are interesting for enterprises, you know, you actually charge for them. This, for example, you know, how uh, MySQL gets funded. You know, all the, all the distributed database stuff, you know, you can get that for free. And there is some conflict in there because basically, you know, by uh, open sourcing just part of the product, you get sometimes to the, you know, to the conflict with communities. As people, you know, may contribute features that are part of your proprietary offering, and I know there could be pretty bad clashes between the community and the, the company behind the software. Uh, and then software as a service. That's uh, like a model that WordPress uses. 
you know, uh, you can get WordPress as a you no know, open source uh, content management system installed on your server, you know, run it, you know, no charges, right? But if you want to avoid all the administration tasks and just uh, you know, use the blogging services, you go to WordPress.com, you pay some annual fee, and they maintain the service for you. So that's like, that's the last from the sustainable. I found like 14 more. <laughs> You no, know, from Kickstarter to selling, selling T-shirts to pay what you want, you know all of that. Uh, but you know I couldn't find any evidence that this is something you can run a company on, because like T-shirts eventually, you know, you sell it to all the users you have and you are done. So this is to uh, know uh, to understand what the, what's the open source and what could be the business models behind it and where RHEL is. Uh, then RHEL is Linux distribution. So this is one, one more definition of what the distribution is. And again, Wikipedia, you, know, you can read through it. But you know, where it connects to open source is actually the, this paragraph that actually says that typically our Linux distribution includes open source software and free software that are available both as binaries and as a source code. So. Uh, Based on all of this, you, you now know or refreshed. You know, it's easy to say a Red Hat Enterprise Linux is an enterprise-grade Linux distribu distribution with support and service business model, right? That's a very short definition, but that's only one way how to look at RHEL. It just gives you the, what's the business behind it, how RHEL looks, but it doesn't give you any other uh, dimension of RHEL is, and RHEL is like a huge beast. What I mean by huge, it, it is something that's big. And when I was thinking how to show scale of RHEL, I was thinking, hmm, so one way how to look at it is uh, how many source RPMs we had, uh, we used to build a server version of the system. And the source RPM is basically, uh, like you could make it equal to one upstream project that's being packaged in a way that you know we can distribute it. So this went from like 900 in like 2006, 410 advanced server through 1300, that's 511, to 1900, that's 610, to 2200 in RHEL 7.6 last fall, and you know 80 beta had a little bit over that. So that shows you what we are dealing with in terms of how many projects we need to integrate together to work as one piece of software. Because customers don't care about this package or that package. They do care about the functionality that the whole thing provides. So that actually tells the story of how we were getting bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of complexity we have to deal with, right? But that's just, just one dimension. And Brandon, I can give you a link to those data, no problems. And uh, there is one more slide I actually created, and that's this one. And you know, the numbers are small, so those are years. This is 5,000, 10, 15, and 20,000. And what I actually looked at is stuff we can measure at Red Hat. And this is how, bug, how many bugs we closed every single year for L. And uh, so you can see that you know, it went through relatively small numbers in 2006, 2007, to something that's like very close to 10,000 a year in past couple of years. And if you look at these spikes, this is just a, a luck that we may, you know, may managed to release two minor versions in one year. So that's why, it, otherwise it would be spread out rough, roughly even. You can see that this is basically double of this, this one. And uh, if you recall I said, this is just minor versions. So this doesn't show 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, or 8.0 work at all, because that work's actually happening mostly in upstream, in Fedora, we don't measure it in-house. And it would skew the, the numbers anyway. But you know, for me, this is terrifying view. This is how much we crank through the system. 
every single year. And you know, the other piece is, as you remember how the number of packages grew over time, you can actually reflect that in the number of bugs we fixed, because this is row four, five, six, seven. This is one that's a, a software collection that's an offering on top of RHEL. So nobody's running away, that's good. So uh, if you have all this in mind, uh, how actually we work with upstream, right? And last definition, I promise. I was looking what upstream is, so again, Wikipedia, just to refresh the, the memories. So it's basically, you know, it refers to a direction towards the original authors or maintainers. So when we say, you know, I send patch upstream, uh, I know we basically send patch of where I took the software from. It could be Apache Foundation, Foundation GNU.org, or Kernel, et cetera, right? So having refreshed that, uh, I was thinking about when we work with upstream, there are actually two types of interactions. The first one is how we actually keep up with upstream. And what I mean by that is, this Red Hat has, like RHEL has hundreds and hundreds of engineers behind it as a product. But think about two, 3,000 packages we get into the system, right? It, it's a power play not, that doesn't go in our favor at all. So uh, we need to have a ways how to keep up with what's happening out there and where we actually uh, don't have too much control about what's going on. And the answer to this is Fedora, right? I mean, it's probably a common knowledge in the room. Uh, you know, there's like thousands of upstream projects that you know, we go, you know, that all gets integrated in Fedora. And uh, you know, why I say integrated? Because you know, one of the main goals for distribution is actually making sure it provides a coherent user experience. So the integration is the key piece the, the distribution does. Integration of all the pieces so it works together. And uh, so there's a lot of integration work happening in the Fedora project that's being sponsored by Red Hat. And that actually when you want to look where RHEL is heading, this is the place. There's no other place you can have a look. And uh, you know, from time to time, for every three, four years, we pick one Fedora version and we make RHEL out of it. So this is really true that you know, most of the development happens here. And uh, the RHEL is basically using Fedora as, up, as upstream and Fedora is using you know, all the projects out there as upstream. And the way this goes, uh, you know, RHEL leverages all the, all the work that happens here with integration and testing, but you know, this is still not good enough for enterprise customers to deploy in production environment. Uh, this picture looks simple. In real life, it's a little bit more complicated because there are projects like Atomic Host that were initially developed here and then moved into Fedora and then you know, the whole workflow was straightened up to make sure like most of the stuff happens here before getting back to RHEL. Uh, there are a couple of basic principles when we work with upstream and the number one one, one is upstream first policy. Uh, what does it mean is when we develop a patch, a feature, something, we need to make sure it gets integrated uh, in an upstream project. And there is a really pragmatic reason behind that. And that reason is that if we get all the code into upstream, the next time we take the source code, we get all those patches with it. So we don't carry the burden of maintaining everything in house because you know, we couldn't scale that way. So we're making sure that as much as we do gets accepted and uh, we can actually then work with that later on. Uh, the other piece is influencing upstream. And I know in my world, like when you look at the closed source software, those guys control what they do, right? Uh, in open source world, that, that's not true. 
So we cannot tell Apache Foundation, do this, because we want you to do it. That, that wouldn't fly, right? Uh, you know, all we can do is actually influence them. And influencing happens through developers. So when it matters for Red Hat, we do make sure that there are developers behind what matters, and those developers are talking with upstream, making sure that uh, you know, we get our stuff in. Maybe we don't get what we want, but we get as close as we can. And uh, you know, I wanted to also mention rebasing versus patching, because it goes back to the upstream first policy. You know, when we deciding uh, how to fix a problem inside, very often the fix is already out there. And uh, there's a like, decision to make if to take just that one piece, you know, a couple of lines of code, or if to take the whole new version. And that's a decision that's actually happening on the front lines of, in, of the engineering, like every now and then. Like I would say almost every day, but that would be a little bit overstatement, but you know, it happens pretty frequently. And this is also influencing how we work with upstream. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> sometimes upstream moves way too fast for us to keep up with it, especially you know, when we need to freeze uh, the features. So sometimes we backport stuff and sometimes we keep up with upstream. Uh, so that was how we keep up, how we make sure that you know, whatever happens out there without our control, you know, we can use it, we can actually ship it to our customers. The other thing, how I Know, what, what we deal with is actually how we drive the change. And uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, internet is full of controversial feder federalists. It's just Google it. You'll find like articles back from 2011, 2010, when federal did something the uh, community didn't like. So I was thinking there's actually like three buckets when we drive the uh, the features in upstream. So one is it's relatively easy, right? There are upstream communities where we have really good cooperation with, really good relationships with. I named a couple of those, like kernel, that's a long, like, that's evergreen. You know, we are very heavily invested there. Kubernetes, that's a little bit different example from the last two years where major companies, including Google, us, are collaborating together to create orchestration layer for containers. And there's many and many others. So this is a not as easy, but relatively easy game to play. Well, it can be also hard, right? Uh, I picked three uh, because of those three are probably something you can recall. Like SC Linux, uh, most people still turn it off. I even won't ask question, because uh, I would see way too many hands I <laughs> that I would like. Uh, but from our point of view, from enterprise point of view, this is a must-have feature to actually be able to sell to government. Because this is one of the key elements to get government, government certifications like FIPS or common criteria. And without that, we cannot hit public sector in North America at all. That would be a huge loss from the financial point of view. So this is something we do push as a company is not very well accepted. It took years and years and years to get at least decent user experience. And you know, we still keep pushing that. Uh, System D, uh, that's another story uh, connected to 7.0 when uh, you know, there was a huge, huge discussion, you know, who will take this, which distribution will ship it, which will not, you know, how, how it's, sorry, how it sucks, right? And you know, there were like strong, people supporting it, there are people who dislike it. Like, it's a really controversial feature even now, four years later. And the team did a great job on making sure like it's a really, really nice piece of software to work with, but there are still people like me who don't get the basics because um, I was born so early that I still have any D in my head, right? So the change is hard and I don't pretend that. GNOME 3 is another thing that hit a lot of users. And I know there are people you know, loving KDE or other desktop, so this is maybe not that impactful, but still, like, you know, this, this was a change where we had to, you know, we were pushing a new behavior to, to users through 
a software because the GNOME 3 and GNOME 2 control was completely different. Now it's much better now, but you know, there was a huge uh, degradation of usability for many when going from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3. So uh, those are examples where you know, we struggled. We d couldn't, you know, couldn't give up in some of the cases, and uh, you know, it doesn't earn, off, uh, earn us many credits. But there's actually a third bucket, and I call it, it can be even harder than that. <laughs> and uh, you know, I picked just one example here, and this is Docker, and this is a great example of uh, us colliding with business objectives of a different company. Because the Docker, the company, was actually fighting over patches with us, which ones to take in, which ones to reject. Because what Red Hat wanted from Docker as the software was different thing than what Docker as a com company wanted from the same piece of the software. Uh, great news is, uh, you know, we have forking in open source world. It's pretty commonly used to create, you know, um, competition. You know, you can work this, work around this in different ways. So, uh, you know, we actually solve this as part of RHEL 8 uh, via a different uh, tool chain that actually provides the same functionality, even the compatibility layer but you know, we don't have to fight over patches anymore. So uh, that's how I think you know, we work with upstream. And you know, as I said, we can have a discussion later on where we, where we're heading. Uh, then I was thinking how actually open source impacts what we do, right? No, it's not, it almost always goes both ways. We influencing them, they influence us. And uh, I use word influence because that's the key. And you know, there's so many, many, many sources, but you know, I always use kernel as a great source of uh, showing what we do as Red Hat. Because when you look here, you know, we are second in like comparison by change set. You know, we are in fourth place by comparison how many lines we changed in uh, the 420 kernel. And uh, it's a lot more deep. A lot of what we do, as a program manager, I look at the number in a different way. So uh, let's pick this one, 7%, right? There's the 7% of code we contributed, we had some control over what it does. Because of maybe we, you know, we, you know, we had to push it through the approval process of kernel community, maybe we worked with Intel engineers, with customers, etc. But 93% went from elsewhere. And it went from very good places, right? AMD, Intel, those are probably the best guys to support their chipset, so that makes a lot of sense. But uh, it also means that there was no control over what we do there. So what it does is we influencing what's happening in kernel, but we also have to live sometimes with what we actually get. And product managers at Red Hat love the term pizza we didn't order. Because sometimes they get stuff they may not like, but they have to live with it. So uh, other things that are happening is, uh, I, and I also almost, uh, sorry, again mean, I uh, mentioned the upstream first policy. So. Uh, when you think about it, if we try to work on everything with upstream, uh, it also means it influences us internally. It can very well happen that if, if you are a customer of Red Hat, you say, I want this fixed, that uh, we tell you, I'm sorry, we cannot fix this for you because it clashes with where up, is upstream heading, or maybe you know, uh, it takes us months and months because first patch gets rejected, second patch gets, patch gets rejected, and it takes us some time to actually uh, make sure that we have a solution that's satisfies both customers' needs and the project we actually interact with. So that's, that's a pretty significant impact in some cases, especially when we start you know, looking at some controversial features. Uh, the other piece that, that hit us pretty well is kernel ABI or user space ABI promise. What that means is, you know, we're basically promising our customers, if you compile something on 7.1, you 
it will run on 7273 for some specific you know, uh, list of system calls or library calls. And uh, there's not too many upstreams that actually think about anything like that. Uh, which actually means that we have to put a lot of effort into making sure nothing breaks as we are using newer and newer version of some packages. And you know, there are some uh, libraries like glibc that actually do miracles there, you know, they have a mechanism how to work with it, etc. But elsewhere it could be a lot of work. Now the other piece that upstream is not thinking about at all is life cycle, right? They you know, release new versions when they are ready, uh, you know, they, they may drop backward compatibility altogether, and yet on RHEL we promised 10 years of support. So uh, like when we shipped 7.0 back in 2014, we'll have to live with it until 2024. So there's a lot of time uh, that we have to maintain that piece of software. And maybe even now there are versions of packages that are in the RHEL 7 that upstream doesn't care about at all. So again, that's extra work we have to put into all of this to make sure that uh, the product is usable, it doesn't have any, any you know, major security flaws. The other piece is maintenance. So very often, if there is a bug fix that you know, we need to develop for a very old version of a software, you know, it goes out of our pockets, right? You now we have people who actually have to work on it. And uh, like, when I was looking how much stuff we actually solve, I don't have a, like I have a data, I didn't want to bombard you with a really you know, busy graph, but we fix roughly 200 issues like that every single month. There's a lot of work that happens just to make sure that uh, customers can use RHEL as a stable operating system. The other part that actually is impacted by uh, open source <coughs> is the program team. And what program team is? Program team is a team that actually drives the planning and development of individual releases. And uh, you know, at some point, we figure out there's you know, one team doesn't rule them all. It didn't fly at all. And you know, we had to split and create about, it depends, it changes all the time. Like it was initially 20, now it's almost 40 different subsystem teams that actually handle individual technological areas. So like kernel subsystem, kernel networking, low level libraries, stuff like that. And uh, this actually led to a delegation of responsibilities closer to the code. Uh, but my second line on the, on the slide says distributed decision making. And what I mean by that? Of course, the subsystem team contributed to that. Uh, because of, uh, you know, we pushed the decision one level lower, those teams are now like handling their own stacks. But also developers uh, have to make decisions on their own. When they actually work with upstream projects, there's a lot of decisions they have to make. And you know, they, not every of them could be bubbled up, you know, decided and bubbled down. So uh, there's a lot of that's happening in the engineering organization where engineers are actually asked to do partially product management work because of they have to. Product management wouldn't scale at all. And the last piece that I think you know, impacted RHEL program really significantly is uh, speed up of the whole software world. Uh, what I mean by that, it was okay back in <clears throat> 2006, 7 to do waterfall, right? Because of like we were releasing every like six to nine months, uh, you know, it was an okay pace for customers. Uh, the upstream wasn't changing that frequently. That's not a picture you can see today. So, uh, we actually started to adopt Agile, but some pieces of the company can never be Agile. They, <clears throat> like marketing, you know, they cannot deliver marketing message every week, right, or every two weeks. 
So we still have to make sure that we work in waterfall fashion and the program level as an interface to other, other uh, organizations in the company or uh, to our partners, and yet using agile principles inside to make sure we can keep up with a pace of development. And this is my last but one slide, because when you think about it, the picture I just painted is, there is a lot of issues connected with open source development, right? Lack of control, people do what they want, you know, you have to influence, which is much more time consuming than actually uh, ordering people what to do, etc. And why do we do it, right? And I think the answer is very simple because open source is superior development model. It's much better than closed source because you get collaboration, you could never ever get on the closed source uh, development model, <clears throat> especially with partners, like you know, we interact with Intel, AMD, we interact with HP, you know, a lot of companies. You get transparency, people can look at your code, can contribute, often by you know, looking at code you get peer reviews, uh, many, many open source projects actually adopted release, early release often. That means uh, like they don't wait until they have a perfect solution for everything. And there is a competition. Like there are mo most of the cases for one, ish one problem, there is multiple solutions you can try and you can actually decide which one actually fits best for you. So um, I would like to wrap up with, it's not easy to do open source development it's not easy to run business in an open source company, but it's definitely worth it because you know, our customers are actually voting by buying the, the software from us. So, and with that, I would like to wrap up and there's roughly 10, time, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, 15 minutes. Okay, who wants to start? Brendan's smiling. I'm not sure if that means he wants to ask something or. <laughs> I think, okay. So thanks for your attention. Hopefully it was useful for you. And then if you need anything, I'll be in the corridor writing to me as you wish. Thanks a lot.